Okay, everyone, good morning. A very happy Monday to you. How are you starting off this brand new week? I hope you're well and feeling good about things. You certainly should feel good about Celtic. We're going into a brand new week. It's an exciting week as well. The UEFA Champions League is back. We have an opportunity to get to 10 points after five games in that competition Wednesday night against Club Bruges. And things domestically are going swimmingly as well. We beat Hearts 4-1 yesterday. Um, that's always nice. Three points clear of Aberdeen, about 100 clear of Rangers at this stage. Everything's good. We're going to talk about that today. Yeah, a great second half display at Tynecastle on Saturday night. Four goals scored in the second half. The likes of Nicholas Kuhn and Adam Ida getting on the score sheet there. And yeah, I did say in the reaction yesterday that we did with Stevie, by the way, check that out above. I did say that scoring four goals in one half at Tynecastle was a pretty uh, cool achievement and it was a pretty rare thing. And I was right to say that it was the first time we'd scored four in a single half at Tynecastle since the 7-0 Scottish Cup win in 2013. Uh, we were 5-0 up at half time in that one. So... Yeah, as much as the first half wasn't great at Tynecastle, the second half I thought was an excellent performance. And maybe if you flipped those in another world and you had a scintillating first half display and then just easing off a bit in the second half, maybe it would be viewed slightly differently. I don't know. I think everyone's very positive about the team anyway. Winning 4-1 was a great effort. Hell of an effort from the team, both those who started and those who came off the bench. Now, to get on to some of the finer points from the game, let's go through some of your comments. And, as I've just said, plenty of you touching on the squad element of this team right now. And the fact that everyone is contributing. And maybe that's having a, a big say in why we're scoring so many goals at the moment. Another four on Saturday. Now, we've got the legend Lewis McLean saying, The thing that I like now with Brendan Rodgers' second spell in charge of Celtic is that they keep pushing for the whole of the game, always going for the jugular, just great, quick football. And I know it was pointed out in one of the replies to, to Lewis's comment that um, the fact that we've got five subs now that we can make is, is playing a big part in why we're why we're like playing for 90 minutes as a team and why we're scoring so many goals late on. And I, I agree with that totally. And I don't think that's a massive secret that the the five sub rule that came in what middle of 2020, it was a COVID thing originally, and then they brought it in for good. I don't think there's any doubt that it does favour teams like ourselves who have like amazing subs to, to call upon, but we really use it well. And yeah, it really feels to me like our our subs are more important than ever. And you take Saturday, for example, and you, you bring on like guys like James Forrest and Adam Ida and, and Paolo Bernardo and the impact these guys have on, on the games when they come on. Like long gone are the days when games will peter out at Celtic. It seems now that you've when you've got these guys coming on and getting like maybe only twenty minutes all week to really show what they can do and knowing that what they have to do on the pitch when they do get those 20 minutes has to be good because otherwise they're going to have no chance of actually starting games because our starting team is so strong. I think when you've got that competition, it just works for everyone. And as I say, you take Saturday night, for example, and you look at a couple of the, the goals we scored later on, the third goal, hearts, tire and legs, and it's Paulo Bernardo onto the ball, passes it to Adamida, and Adamida scored. And it was the last goal in particular that I, I wanted to touch on. And obviously it's a penalty that Adamida scores, but the awarding of the penalty uh, was actually a result of us breaking really quickly. And yeah, you look at this still, and yeah, it's the three runners we have there is, uh, are, are Adamida, James Forrest, and Hyunjun Yang on the right. And I'm not saying that Kyogo, Maida and Kuhn wouldn't also have been sprinting had they been in the park. I think they, they would have because they're all incredibly fit and hungry. But I think when you've got that extra freshness to rely on off the bench and counter there, that's just like the perfect example of um, Celtic just being able to put these games to bed and 
but like this time last year, and I mean the the five sub rule is great, and we're we're making good use of it. But it's we you have to make good use of it. This time last year, I don't remember the the subs rule being as effective for us because there was a lot of games that were going on to late on that were still in a lot of doubt. We very rarely go into domestic games now, go into the last 15, last 10, last five minutes with these games in doubt because we're killing games off. So we're we're clearly making good use of it and the squad we have at the moment of players, both starting games and subs who are coming on and impacting games is immense. But yeah, just away from the whole sub rule, just generally there's such a desire from the team I think, to use every single minute of the match. And that comes from the manager, Brendan Rodgers. It's something he's spoken about a fair bit. You know, at Celtic, your standards have to be as high as possible. You can't ever go through uh, games not fancying it because when you're at Celtic, every domestic match you play is a cup final for the opposition. They're going to raise their game. Um so Brendan Rogers has spoken about that. You know, Callum McGregor, I'm sure, will make the point continually to the players. He's not the kind of captain that at 3 1 up or or 3 0 up and, and Saturday's going to say, right, that's fine, guys. Look, we're looking ahead to Bruges. Now, he's going to be pressing the team every single moment of every single match to keep going, score more goals. And yeah, as I say, Rogers, big part of that, McGregor, big part of that, other guys as well. And it's something that Ange Postacoglu spoke about in, in his time in charge as well. And on that note, we've got Alf Mancini. The squad mentality kicked off with Ange. Be ready to come and play your part when asked. Be at five minutes. Love it. And I thought that comment was interesting because like, clearly over what the last three and a half years, basically since that dreaded COVID season, um, when clearly things went so horribly wrong at the club that we needed like a reset and we got that reset when Ange Postacoglu came in middle of 2021 um, that was clearly like the start of a new era and he signed a whole new squad of players but I think it's interesting because obviously we've had the Postacoglu era and we're now living through the the second Rogers era but like I, I don't I don't view it as much like Angie's time or Angie's team and Roger's team. It feels to me in a weird way, as much as they're two very well respected and I guess different iconic Celtic managers, it does feel to me like from Postacoglu coming in in twenty twenty one that there has just been a gradual evolution through this team throughout his reign, getting better and better, and that's continued when Brendan Rodgers has come in. And obviously we had that like period last year when things looked maybe for a, a little spell like they might be going badly wrong. And, you know, looking back at that, there was clearly things going on at that stage that we don't need to go into again. But um, you can see reasons for why maybe we, we weren't um, playing so well and, and weren't winning as many games. But... Um, yeah, like I look at all the characteristics of that Postacoglu team, you still see in the team today, but it just seems to me like Brendan Rodgers has taken Postacoglu's team to the next level. And obviously he's signed some players and you know there's a number of players in Saturday's team now that, that weren't part of the Ange era. But it does feel to me like throughout the last four seasons that we have just been gradually building to this moment and um it's just it's a hell of a sight when it when it all comes together like in that second half. Uh, and I think the team now is, is more experienced than they have been in recent years. Um, I think a lot of the players are improving. Like say, Take someone like Dyson Maida, for example. And the Dyson Maida we see nowadays compared to the Dyson Maida from two seasons ago is, is night and day. So like he's making improvement and there's obviously a number of players as well. And yeah, the mentality is, is still there. Um, that if Even if you're not starting games you will be required to come on and, and you know, set up a goal or, or really produce for us. Just because you're not starting a game doesn't mean that you're not expected to do that. And like you look at Paolo Bernardo as, as a perfect example of this. He's only started two of our last nine matches, which I think I think is pretty harsh. I think Paolo Bernardo's a, a great player. He's not, apart from that first half in, in Dortmund when everyone was off it, He's not actually really put a foot wrong this season, Paolo Bernardo, yet he's not really starting many games. But does he get frustrated? 
Does he throw his arms up in the air? Is there any petulance from him? No, he comes on, and quite often only for 20, 25 minutes, but he comes on and he produces again like he did on Saturday night. James Forrest, another example. For me, for me, James Forrest is a, is a great, a modern great of Celtic Football Club when you consider all the trophies he's won, what he's offered for is the fact he's probably going to be a, a one-club man with Celtic. And I think someone said, Paul McStay was maybe the last one. Um, and James Forrest isn't starting games either, and I'm sure you know he'll be very frustrated privately. But does he ever show it? No, he comes on again on Saturday and just is always very reliable and offers us something extra. And that's just two examples of an entire squad that are, rather than looking out for themselves, they're looking out for the betterment of the team. And that was a very Postacoglu thing. And now it's a very Brendan Rodgers thing as well and that's what I mean you see all the traits of that team that are in this team and I just view it as one continual um, upward curve we've been on over the, the past four seasons and the thing is you, you think there's like far more levels for this team to go like imagine we get a recruitment to a higher level and can improve on these positions and can replace players you know maybe a bit better than we've done in the past and if we crack it in Europe and we appear to be doing that this season, like the sky is the limit for this team. It's very exciting. Huey on a simul similar, Yozo Simulov, it doesn't matter. On a similar note, in my almost 60 years watching Celtic, I truly believe that this is the strongest squad we have ever had. We may have had a better starting 11, but our subs bench is full of potential starters. I can't comment in the last 60 years, Huey, because uh, I've only been watching Celtic for about 20. Certainly this is as strong a squad as I can remember seeing. I think as fans, and probably for Brendan Rodgers as well, you always want like two good players, two players you can rely on for every position. And I genuinely think looking at our squad right now, you're only really a left winger away from being able to say that about this current squad. And obviously there's other positions that maybe you'd want another striker and maybe some people would want a, a better um, deputy right back. And I know the left back situation's a little bit up in the air with Vai and Taylor not totally knowing what's going on there at the moment. But as you look at the squad right now, it is, for me, yeah, it's the strongest squad that, that I can remember seeing at Celtic. We've got always Zilla, unpopular opinion. I always like these. Bernardo looks a better player than Engels. Hmm. Yeah. Listen, I I, I love Paulo Bernardo. I think um, he's a really good player. I, I guess, and I don't know about this comment specifically from always Zilla, but I guess generally some people are, are quite down in Arnie Engels at the moment. I know Stevie mentioned in yesterday's video that he wants to see more from him. I think we'll have to maybe talk about Engels. I'm expecting Engels to dominate these type of games. And I know he was away by Belgium, so I'm not being harsh because you know I'm a fan. I really do. I really do like him. But I can also understand some of the criticism. I think as fans, there's nothing wrong with having high standards, high expectations. And clearly, like Engels came into the club in his first few games, he was pretty spectacular. Think back to that Slovan Bratislava game and. Like he was brilliant that night, one man of the match, didn't he? And I think it's fair to say that he hasn't he hasn't maintained that level, he hasn't hit that level really in the, the last five or six weeks. But like was it ever a realistic expectation for him to continue to hit that level? Genuinely, when you think of all the factors, you know, a young guy, and I'm well aware Paulo Bernardo's young as well, but just speaking about Engels, a young guy coming across to a new country getting to grips with a new manager, new team, a new league, new expectations. And, like, it's not as if the guy's playing badly. He's not sticking out as a bad player to me. So that's where I really struggle with some of the criticism. I've seen some, for me, some way over-the-top stuff about Engels saying that, you know, he's just not going to make it at Celtic. And he's, I saw someone saying, like, he's holding the team back at the moment and someone else should be in his place. And I just think that's, like, massively over the top. He's not playing at the level he was when he first joined, but he's not playing badly. I think he's still offering and, and contributing to, to what is a winning team. And yeah, I guess 
Paolo Bernardo is really liked as well, and it's probably a compliment to Bernardo that people are saying he should be starting ahead of Engels. But generally speaking about Engels, if we look kind of long term, I have no real concerns about him. I have no concerns about him not reaching the the level that we want him to. I think it's just going to take a bit of time. And there will be a moment, I think, hopefully sooner rather than later, hopefully this season. Um, but there'll be a moment when we look at Engels and we go, yeah, that's it. He's the guy who's going to play really well for us and then he's going to move on for maybe double, maybe even more than what we paid for him. And there'll be a moment like that, just like we had with, with Matt O'Reilly when you realise, yeah, Matt O'Reilly's pretty special. And by the way, I, I know Engels is a different player to O'Reilly. I'm just comparing them because O'Reilly's the most recent example of a midfielder we have coming in um, and improving and then being sold on. So I have no no worries, genuinely no worries that like Engel's going to turn out to be a complete dud who we're going to have to move on in a year or whatever. And I don't know, if, does anyone actually feel like that? I get that you have to call it as you see it, and at the moment, you know, it's game by game, and maybe Engel's isn't playing at the level of Real Hitati at the moment or someone like that, but I just think we all need to chill out with him. Um, he's going to be absolutely fine for us, and... You can clip this up or whatever and, and view it in a year's time, two years' time. I'm certain that Arnie Engels is going to turn out to be a really good Celtic player who will do really well for us and will then leave us for a hell of a lot of money. Didn't even cover your Bernardo or Engels point there. I managed to sidestep that with, just like Stevie did yesterday. Okay, Ger Lahr. Saying, uh, a lot of the players clock up a lot of miles playing for their country. Our three Japanese stars, Ali Johnston and Trusty, they didn't get many minutes, but the air miles and time zones do zap the energy levels. It's over until March, so hopefully between now and then we will see the players playing at the optimum level and by the time of the next international break, the league will be finished. The League Cup will be back in the trophy room and hopefully we will be in the last eight of the Champions League. Steady on, mate. Great three points, no injuries, and Bruges is the next one to tick off. A massive game, but we need to up the levels from the Hearts victory and put in another top display and make it 10 points in the Champions League, something we never thought would happen. And I think it's a fair point you make about the international breaks just zapping the momentum or, or halting the momentum, I guess. And uh, luckily now we don't have them for a while, so we can just go from game to game and, and pick that up. And listen, we're going to have good games, we're going to have bad games. I think we're going to drop some points domestically over the next few months um, just with all the various stuff going on. And it's funny because I was thinking earlier today, see after like bigging up this intense period of matches and like I'm, I'm so excited for it but I was thinking earlier like it's funny because if we beat Bruges in midweek, we get to 10 points, we're pretty much guaranteed a spot in the top 24 of the Champions League. Obviously, there's still an opportunity for us to, in the last three matches, win more games and get further up the table, etc. But the prime objective that Brendan Rodgers spoke about at the start of the season, finishing in the top 24, winning Wednesday night and we're like there, almost certainly 10 points would be enough. And then the following midweek, we go to Pataudry and if we win there, which again, I think... You know, clearly a tough game, but you would expect Celtic to do based on how we play, based on the way we played against Aberdeen at Hamden. You then go at least six points clear in them, you would think. And uh, suddenly like we look pretty clear in the league and suddenly you're going, right, okay, this Celtic team is actually playing so well and doing so well that maybe um, they're like passing and, and meeting all these expectations and passing all these expectations much earlier than expected. Obviously still get like a League Cup game and as I say, these matches are still going to be pretty amazing but it was a thought I had, I think we all had it built in our head over these next three months that like so much would be decided and the reality might be that this Celtic team might be so far ahead of schedule this season that um, as I say, we could be ticking off various things quite early. So yeah, goody two views. A lot of people moaning about the late kickoff. I loved it. Saturday night in, a few cans and slightly giddy due to Rangers and Don's results. Totally selfish from my point of view. I suppose it was a bit of a drag for those travelling. But Saturday night, not many working the next day, I presume. It was obviously a early Sunday morning kickoff for me here. 
it's a bit different. But I definitely like the idea of Saturday night football. Again, probably a, a bit different for people who were actually at the game on Saturday night, getting home, I don't know, pretty late, let's just say. But certainly from my unbiased view of the other side of the world, uh, I quite like the idea of Saturday night football. It seems a preferable kickoff time to me than lunchtime on a Saturday or lunchtime on a Sunday. It seems seems to be more of an event, a Saturday night game. I know a, a number of my my friends were out for the game, for example, or, or around it, other mates watching the game. Ne- wouldn't necessarily happen for a lunchtime kickoff. So I think from that point of view... It was certainly positive. I think the atmosphere could have been better at Tynecastle. I think Tynecastle could have been fuller. It would have been great if uh, Celtic had the old allocation back and I think the atmosphere would have been much better. Interesting that um, Boys Celtic actually put a statement out on that subject yesterday. Uh, I'll read this quickly because it's pretty long. The ongoing away ticket saga for Hearts meant the vast majority of the group could not attend the match The away allocation given to Celtic was 632, which had to be split between players, sponsors, corporates and everybody else, meaning most regulars had to settle for watching the game on TV. For a long time now, we've witnessed the hunt for tickets cause unnecessary division and friction amongst our support. It is our opinion that the club should refuse to accept such a small allocation until a sensible conversation that prioritises match-going supporters can be had on the issue. While Hearts and every other club are entitled to offer what they like, we again question the logic of allowing hundreds or even thousands of empty seats when there are as many fans willing to pay to fill them. There must be a way of achieving a more suitable arrangement for all parties as well as the overall product. In order to support Celtic in some capacity, we attended the B-team's 4-0 victory over Albion Rovers in Airdrie on Friday night. Cheap tickets, Friday night football and relaxed security all contributed to a positive, fun and different experience to what we have become accustomed to. A very timely reminder of what football should be like. Difficult one this and it's clearly an issue we've spoken about a lot and it's like it's one of those issues that like uh, how much more can we speak about it because like nothing ever changes it's from a Celtic point of view it's really disappointing to see these empty seats when we know we could fill them with our own fans if given the opportunity from another club's point of view it's their stadium they don't want thousands of Celtic fans to be there taking over their stadium so they're entitled to do that so like at the end of the day it is their stadium, so they can do that if they want. But it really doesn't make it right. I think it's so disappointing. Like Again, as I say, that the Hearts-Celtic game, fair enough, we haven't had really many Saturday night games against them at Tynecastle. But think back to some of the previous games, midweek night games, or even lunchtime games at, at weekends in the past when we had that full stand, or even half the stand, which is not ideal, but is better than one block of the stand, Think about how good the atmosphere used to be for those fixtures. I like I remember growing up and always thinking Tyne Castle was incredible because our fans were amazing and you could hear them more because it was a full stand and their fans really rose to that as well. And it became like a proper, properly big fixture for me, one of the biggest fixtures in Scottish football. And Saturday I just thought was a bit of an anticlimax, to be honest. And That's nothing against our fans. Our fans were amazing. Our team were amazing to win the game so comfortably. But, like, it just seemed very quiet and and lacking that ferocity. And to be honest, I think the the game lacked a bit of ferocity as well because the atmosphere wasn't massively there. I think, and it's not something I've I've ever really heard too many people speaking about because I think it's widely felt that as much as fans can influence games and clearly atmospheres, etc., um, generally what happens on the park is what happens on the park. But I do think some of these big matches on the pitch are less chaotic and less frenetic and less action-packed when the atmosphere isn't as good off the pitch. Like, I think some of the Celtic Rangers games have been a bit quieter on the pitch. 
when they've been a bit quieter off the pitch. And I think that was the case on Saturday night as well. And it's disappointing because as fans, you want to go and, and put on these games and hear incredible atmospheres and see amazing games. And I just thought Saturday night was set up for all of that. And it just ended up not having it at all. Um, and you question from a heart's point of view, like what are you what are you getting out that? Because um, I would guess, I mean, I would guess part of uh, clearly part of giving us a reduced allocation is um, to stop Celtic fans taking over Tynecastle. Though I guess it's less of an issue at Tynecastle than it would be used to be at somewhere like Rugby Park, where we get two stands and more fans in them. But I guess another part of it would be some sort of competitive advantage on the pitch, not having a full end of Celtic fans, just having one section. Didn't serve them much good on Saturday night, did it? We still absolutely battered them. Um, so you do question what hearts are getting out of this when there's just like thousands of scattered empty seats around the stadium. Um, when you could have all the hearts fans over three stands, a full, full stadium, great atmosphere, probably a... I don't know necessarily a closer game on the pitch, but certainly a, a more fiery game, uh, a better watch for the neutral on and off the pitch. So, yeah, that's my thoughts. I agree with the uh, boys Celtic, but in the nicest possible way, I don't think their statement's going to achieve much. Celtic aren't going to knock back tickets because we know that Callum McGregor uh, and it was Ange Postacoglu recently, and I'm assuming Brendan Rodgers feels the same way. They'll want Celtic fans there. They'll want one Celtic fan there rather than no Celtic fans. We we saw that with the derby. Uh, Cal McGregor wanted Celtic to have fans at Ibrox rather than knocking back tickets. So that's why we took tickets. So you're not going to see Celtic knock back tickets for Tynecastle. Whether we should or not is a, a different argument. Anyway, we don't need to worry about Tynecastle for a, a wee while. Maybe not even again this season, the way they're going. We are... Looking up in the world, UEFA Champions League, Club Bruges on Wednesday. I'm trying to still find a Club Bruges expert who can come on and chat about them. Um, not been possible yet. I'll keep looking and working hard. If not, we'll still have videos for you tomorrow and on the day of the game. Uh, this is actually the 200th video we've done in Celtic AM, so I guess that's kind of... Irrelevant. I'll see you for 201 tomorrow, everyone. And if you enjoy this channel, please consider clicking or tapping in the middle of your screen right now to subscribe. Speak to you all tomorrow.